and how, when you were born, and what, when did you first start working in the mills? My name is Irvin Otto Friday, Senior. I was born 1913, and I'm 79 years old. And uh, I went to work at, when I was 13 years old at the Modena Cotton Mill. And that was around about 1926, somewhere along in there, I think, right about that time. What'd you do? I uh, worked in the warehouse and did uh, local work, like rolling in coal. We were rolling 40 wheel bars of coal in the morning and 40 wheel <laughs> bar fulls in the evening to run this big steam engine. And then after we did that, we would go and open up the cotton and run it through a machine, and then it'd go into the mill. And then we would bail waste, and uh, they had outhouses. And we would take, had to, uh, they had a two-wheel cart with a mule, and we'd take buckets and dump that stuff out, <coughs> turn the outhouses over, mm -hmm. and, and haul that stuff off and bury it. <laughs> then that was so <laughs> we had that we had to do that once a week, clean out those outhouses. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> so that we was just uh, you know mostly what we call uh, common labors. You know we didn't. Uh, we never did. Well, the only one that worked in the mill, they had two women that kept the mill scrubbed, the floors, you know. They would spit a lot of tobacco spit on the floor, and these women would have to go in there. That was their job, scrubbing. Six days a week, scrubbing, oh, <laughs> scrubbing the floor. <laughs> and it was a long time before they uh, let the black women go in and run, do spinning, you know. They had to teach them, you know, and that. But, but it was... Uh, Everybody was happy. Nobody never did complain about it. Well, now, back then, did you ever remember asking yourself why it was that you couldn't work in inside the mill and run machines and that kind of thing? Well, I, I knew the, what the problem was, but I never did say anything about it because you might lose your job back then, you know, if you start to drop and, you know, back then, you know, you couldn't, you just had to be quiet and go along with the flow. <laughs> How'd you, how'd you get your job? Well, um, at that time, my dad, he run this engine on the third shift. And uh, when I became old enough to run, I mean to work, they uh, let me, I went to work at I was 13 years old. No sooner you get 13 years old, you could work in the mill. So that's how I got the job. Then. Uh, most of the people at the farm then, there has been many people have public jobs then, just a few blacks had public jobs like that. Most of them farm, you know, and, and uh, share crop or farm, whatever you call it, you know, they farm. And so I forgot about that, I guess <laughs> that. And uh, so we we lived, you know, my dad would raise a, a bale of cotton here. Um, he had three acres here, and then, then he would uh, rent some ground, and then he would take and uh, raise three bales of cotton on this ground, and he, when he sell the cotton, he'd pay the rent uh, for the land that he used. And we had a cow, and we had hogs, and we'd gather up. We'd come to the mill village and, and get scraps, you know, where people throw it away, and feed the hogs. Mm -hmm. So we had a little corn, you know, to go with that the scraps we'd gather around. We, that was our... Do we did that every day. When we get off from work, we go around them houses and pick up scraps to feed the hogs. But you were working how many hours a day? From six to six, and it was seven dollars and some cents a week. So we was making. Well, when did that uh, get better? Well, um, let's see. That was going on. Who was town? Let's see. When did who get out of there? Uh, Roosevelt got elected. Yeah, Ro and Roosevelt got yeah. elected. Well, that's when things turned around. We would, we would, they paid us a little bit more an hour and everything. And we, we'd work eight hours instead of from six to six. We work eight hours a day, and uh, we, we, it was some hard work. But you know, everybody was stout then. We was, I was thirteen years old, handling a bale of cotton weight. 
1,300 pound Egyptian cotton. They'd ship that Egyptian cotton over from the, from Egypt somewhere over across the sea. And uh, this regular cotton that we raised around here averaged four and 500 pounds. So that was just a, uh, this light work, you know. Mm. But when you handle that big 1,300 pound bale of Egyptian cotton, he was a strong boy, a strong <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you. And then uh, my mother would fix our dinner. See, it was two. Uh, my brother, he passed. So he had a, that killed in a wreck. Uh, my brother and I and my dad worked up there. So my mother would fix one big box of lunch, you know, and we'd carry that every morning. When dinner time come, we all, all three of us sit down and eat lunch. <laughs> And then uh, we go back to work. We take about 15 minutes to eat, and then we go back to work. We did that during the whole depression. Uh, when did your wages get better? That was uh, when Roosevelt, uh, during his administration, things picked up. You know, mm -hmm. we it went from uh, seven cents an hour. To, we went on up to about twelve dollars a week. Twelve dollars a week, but still working. Uh, from six to six, and get off Saturday at twelve o'clock. Well, now there was something back then called the NRA, the Blue Eagle. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember that. Uh, and people were supposed to get paid. Uh, they're supposed to work only eight hours a day, mm -hmm. and they were supposed to get paid a minimum of, of eleven dollars a week. Right. But everybody didn't get that much money. No, huh? No, we are. Uh, they had uh, they had two uh, had two payrolls, you know. Some made six dollars, seven dollars a week, and some made twelve. <laughs> so you know how that was. <laughs> well, let me tell you, uh, we've got some letters here uh, written by black workers to Washington, mm -hmm. protesting against the way that uh, the New Deal rules were being enforced. Mm -hmm. Here's one. It's directed to. Mr. Hugh Johnson, that's from Belmont, uh, that's from Gastonia, mm -hmm. North Carolina, uh, in uh, 1933. It was addressed to Hugh Johnson, who was supposed to s see that those things were enforced. It says, I'm writing you this letter to let you know just how we poor Negroes are being treated here at the Manville Jenks uh, Company, Loray Mill. Mm -hmm. There's some, uh, some work eight hours and some 10, 11, 12 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And all from eight to 12 hours make only 20 cents per hour. And our boss man, T.A. Graham, tell us the new code law don't cover us, they cover us Negroes, mm -hmm. for $12 a week. It's, it's just from white pe just and that the law was just for white people. That's what he says he's been told. Mm -hmm. Um, but he says that, um, please, sir, look after this and do something for us poor Negroes. A white man told us to write you about this. He says a man w working on the time as a timekeeper uh, said we Negroes were all raided in the main office at eight hours a day and 30 cents per hour and $12 a week. And when the NRA inspector comes, they just show him a fake timesheet. Now, did you know anything about that kind of thing, fake timesheets? I didn't know about it, I heard about it. I mean, I didn't, couldn't prove it, I heard about it. Mm -hmm. Couldn't hear about it, but you didn't understand. Yeah, see, yeah. I didn't understand. Because I can remember all of that. I uh, just didn't understand but everything that was going on. We didn't understand, you know, what it meant. And then sometimes it's better that you didn't because you lose your job. That, I remember that Lori Mill. I can remember. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when that was going at that, that strike up to the guy. The policeman got killed. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Yeah. I remember yeah. when they had a terrible strike. Mm -hmm. and I believe as I was a young girl living in the, but you know, we could hear all about it, but we didn't understand it too good. Did it, did it scare you? No, because we, you know, just didn't, 
I guess we just didn't know and didn't understand and didn't know what it all was going to amount to. What were you doing then? No, oh, I was living, we was on the farm. I can remember, you know, you know, you, we took the gaze at, I mean, the, it wasn't the gaze at, it was the Yacht Berlin Choir. Uh -huh. and see the little news would come on the paper. And I went, was in school. I uh -huh. finished high school and see, we could read. And, but it was just so much you could understand. Okay. Mm -hmm. I remember, Laura Emile, Laura Emile. Well, this was in 34 after the law. You see, there was a law then mm -hmm. that said that there was a minimum of there was nobody supposed to get more than eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody was supposed to get less than eleven dollars a week, and the mills were supposed to run just eighty hours uh, a week, you know, so that they wouldn't have too much surplus uh, goods. Right. And this man Johnson got on the radio and said to people that if your employer isn't doing you right, you write me. Mm -hmm. And so that's what this fellow's doing. Uh -huh. He doesn't sign his name. Do you have any, reason, any idea why he didn't sign his name? Well, he would have lost his job and he might have been tarred and feathered. <laughs> 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah. Back then, yeah. they were mm -hmm. still hanging people. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. A lot of clusters around here? Oh, man, yeah. They clucked. Um, they drug up. My dad told me I didn't. I didn't see this. They locked the black man up up there in jail, and uh, the Ku Klux went up there and got him and tied his legs to a, two fast horses and went right down that road there and drug him and hung him down that Long Creek. Hung him uh, down that Long Creek Bridge down there, and nothing there was done about it. Yeah. Drug him right down that road. Mm -hmm. Drug him. He was dead when he got down. Them horses were flying. My daddy said. See, he, my daddy told me all about that. Mm -hmm. the, back in them days, the Ku Klux was bad. I mean, they take you out and kill you, hang you, and shoot you, and do anything. Well, I remember in Winston Salem, even in the twenties, I remember the Ku Klux parading in right around the courthouse square in my mm -hmm. hometown. Mm -hmm. So they were around. Sure. Oh yeah, they yeah, were around. They were around. And you know, as a child, I, I just thought it was come some kind of Halloween parade. <laughs> I had no idea. I had no reason to be afraid, you see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I had no idea what it meant. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a Halloween parade for you. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. No sir. Well now, in 1934, after this law was passed, it's that's fixed hours and fixed wages supposedly. Right. Mm -hmm. It also said that people had a right to form a union. And that was a big question then. Yeah, that was a big question. The black never did, was, was never able to join that union. They just had to still work for whatever to give them. Why couldn't they join the union? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> they were black. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you know, since I'm 78 years old, you know, it's so much I didn't learn until I doing Negro History Month. Now, when we were in high school, history, we we wasn't taught anything. We didn't know anything about about uh, you know the Negroes, what they had invented and all that. I wondered why we wasn't taught that. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that. It wasn't in the books. We didn't know we didn't history. When well, you see, that's one of the reasons why we're here today, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that we're trying to add to that, right. mm -hmm. trying to add to this history. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. exactly why we're here. Mm -hmm. You see, when it's interesting that I grew up in Winston-Salem, mm -hmm. uh, I read something about textile history, but even textile history is made up of the men who built the mills, mm -hmm. the machinery, mm -hmm. and the, the economy. 
but almost nothing about the people who, who did the work. <laughs> That's right. And I knew that there were very few blacks who were allowed to work in the mill. Right. So I just assumed at the beginning that you wouldn't have much to tell me. No. And I'm beginning to find you've got a lot to tell me. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we get up around 4 o'clock every morning when Mother picks us a breakfast and fix that dinner. We walk from here up to, I guess, about two miles from here up to Modena, up there at that stoplight. About two miles there. And we put in from six to six up there. And we was uh, $7 and something a week. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, we figured them hours up to 12 o'clock on Saturday from six to six. That's a lot of hours. Well, now, how much education did you have? I went to uh, part of the ninth grade because, see, during the Depression, I had to come out and help to make a living. And uh, then it lightened back up, and I tried to go back, and the bottom fell out again, and I, I never did go back. Mm -hmm. But that was a lot more education than, oh, than, yeah. than most blacks had at That's the time. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, tried, to, tried to make it. Tried. I wanted to go to college, but I couldn't. Wasn't able. And so you went into the Navy, and what happened after the Navy? Well, after I got out of the Navy, uh, uh, I bought two army trucks. They let the GIs that wanted to go in business to buy trucks and equipment. So I went to Greensboro. They gave me a, a, a letter to go up to Greensboro. I bought a dump truck and a flatbed truck. And then I went to the bank. Uh, what the man that my dad had been leasing the land from, he was the president and told him I wanted to buy a new truck, I mean a, new, a backhoe. So he loaned me the money, just on my, on my word. And he was the only one, and everybody wanted to know how come, how did I get so far up on the ladder. And see, we had good character, and my daddy had worked on the farm for them people and rented land. And he loaned me the money to get this backhoe. And I started out. Well, I had two kids in college, and uh, I was putting in separate tanks, landscaping, laying uh, stone, doing everything. And I had, oh, forget about it. Uh, I had two kids in college. One was at North Carolina. Uh, what was, what did Barbara go to college at? I'm, I'm. No, my dear. Barbara, what college name is She went to North Carolina and Durham. Yeah, North Carolina. Was in Livingston. And, and then my other daughter went to Livingston. Mm -hmm. uh, that's up at uh, Livingston. Then, uh, <laughs> where is, that's in, what's the name? Where is Livingston? Where is Livingston College? What's the Salisbury. Salisbury, yeah. No. <laughs> so they finished. They're doing real good. Barbara, she's, uh, she can retire in a year. And she's uh, over the social service department in Brooklyn. She had uh, around about 300 employees mm. that she was in uh, charge of. So she, she doesn't have enough in New York. She's going to come out when she retires. The mother daughter, she's been teaching school in Hampton now. Oh, how long Jean been teaching? About 30 years, ain't it? Dosh Jean. How long has Dosh Jean been teaching? No, about 25 yeah, years. 25 years. Is that Hampton Institute in Virginia? No, she teaches uh, at the elementary school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hampton, Virginia. Hampton, Virginia. Yeah. But she lives there on her own nice home there. <laughs> she lives about uh, two blocks from the golf course and about a quarter of maybe three maybe a mile from the end of the waterway. You know, when I go up there, you know I play, I don't do it for fishing, play, <laughs> play golf. <laughs> she lives in a nice neighborhood. So you play golf and fish up there? Right. Yeah. I play here when I get a chance, but I've been busy. I cut grass for people. I got two churches and a couple private homes and four concrete. You know, I got some men that help me. Hey. You know. And uh, I stay busy. Did you ever think when you were starting out that uh, your daughters are going to go that far? No, I didn't have no idea that uh, that I would be able to send them because 
it was hard. It was rough. Because I, uh, I have to work. Well, when you're working for yourself, you got to work harder. Mm -hmm. I'd go to work at, at break of day and wouldn't come in till dark, you know. But most money I ever made was $40,000 one year. And uh, I owed for a lot of equipment, you know, I owed the bank a lot of money, and I had those two kids in college. But I made it. And then the bank, I had a lady to, uh, she was a good uh, secretary to keep my book. And she said that I didn't owe the bank, uh, I mean, the intern or whatever, you know, more money. And you know, they went to the bank and took a hundred dollars. And she told them people, she was a white lady, kept my book, that I didn't owe that money. And she told me, she said, this cause you black, they just took your money. Hmm. Now that's right, that's what happened. Hmm. Well, I want to show you, this is the, the letter that Bruce Graham, mm -hmm sent to Washington. Tell us something about Bruce. Oh, Bruce, he was, a, he, he was a good farmer and he loved to fish and, but they uh, never did have any children, but they they take uh, all of their uh, sisters and brothers' children to help their family. And he loved to farm. He, he, he liked to get out there with that mule and plow. He'd raise watermelons and take them over to the eagle mill, corn and beans, take them over to the eagle mill and <laughs> sell them. He was a hustler. <laughs> and he, he moved around and yeah, pretty good. Oh, we were out there the other day, and yeah. he was, I mean, he was moving around. But now, let me read you what he says. He's, this is in 1934, mm -hmm. January the 5th. Mm -hmm. It says, um, Bruce Graham, Route 3, Gastonia, North Carolina. I'm an inside employee. Number one, I'm required to work more than 40 hours a week, which was against the law. Mm -hmm. Two, I operate uh, three machines, a waste feeder, a waste beater, and an opener. That's right. And I'm paid less than 30 cents an hour for work. Three, my employers do me extra compensation from July the 17th, that's when the New Deal, the mm -hmm. NRA went into effect up to the present date, which was January the 5th. And you notice he signs it. Mm -hmm. And the most amazing thing is that, may we use your name if necessary? And he says, yes. Mm -hmm. Which took a lot of guts back then. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And so we talked to him about that. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about somebody, somebody doing that? back in 1934. Well, that's the, this is about as low down as a person can get to another human being. Mm -hmm. Because that's yeah. actually still yeah. slavery in a way. Yeah. yeah. Well, he had, somehow he had the courage to do this. And that's what we're trying to show is that even though the blacks weren't a part of the union, they were, mm -hmm. they were protesting. That's right. Uh, did you hear anything about unions at that time? No. I didn't even know the union was going on. <laughs> yeah. no, didn't mention. Didn't even know what nothing was going on. Yeah. Until uh, they had this big uh, strike up there at uh, uh, Low Ray uh -huh. when the policeman got killed up there. That's the only time we knew anything about it. Well, now in 34, there was an even bigger strike. It hit every mill in mm -hmm. Gaston County mm -hmm. and most of the mills in the country. Mm -hmm. You remember that? Yeah, yeah I, I remember, remember that. that. I remember. Yeah, it was, they were out, your your mill was out for three weeks. Yeah, that, probably longer, I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know what, we uh, we still, they let the blacks work. They, did. they let them work because they had to do the cleaning, you know, and mm -hmm. cost, cost the dough, you know, whatever you call it. But the ones that run the machines, the one, the, the whites, the one that they was, well, they didn't care nothing about. We wouldn't make no money, no way. Didn't nobody want our jobs. <laughs> so, no, I remember yeah. that. We lived on yeah. the backwater where the, those mill hands would come and fish during that time. They would start coming in toward day in the morning, just lining up. And they got so bad, they went to stealing people's chickens and the garden stealing stuff out of the garden 
and uh, they had to stop them from coming in and parking. It parked half our driveway, our yard. We couldn't hardly walk. So my daddy would let them, you know, and that's when that those mills were shut down. They, that's all they would do, come and fish. Sometimes they would stay on the backwater overnight, and then they went to, you know, going in other people's gardens and stealing, and they had the law got my mama and stopped all of that. But nobody got killed or no shooting or nothing like that. Do you remember how your mill got shut down? Um, I believe that they pulled a little strike up there, I believe it, Modena. I just can't remember because, see, when you're on the outside, you don't know what's going on. I don't know whether they put, put them on three days a week or what. But anyway, I know that they, they put them on a short time, and then the mill closed. I never didn't know why it closed. I don't know whether they called it a strike or what. Mm -hmm. But they, they, during the Prussian, you see, we didn't know what was going on. Now, there's something uh, called yeah. flying squadrons that kind of went from mill to mill to try to persuade people to shut down. Do mm -hmm. you remember anything about that? Yeah, I remember, I don't remember that. Uh, they go from mill to mill, and, and then if the, the employees would find out about it, the people would talk to them, they'd find them. Mm -hmm. They'd find them to find out that they were uh, talking to the people that's trying to get them to strike and all that. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me show you some pictures here of back then. See if you can identify them. Uh, this is. Yeah. Okay. You want to sit here? Yeah. Okay. Why don't you sit here? You recognize that? Can you adjust your hearing aid to see that? Adjust your hearing aid. Amma. Yeah, I got my hearing aid. She yeah. said adjust it. It's making a fuss. You hear it? Bump. No, this no. was after low. Okay. You remember? Do you recognize Main Street? Yeah, I remember. This is Gaston. Yeah, uh-huh. Oh, yeah, I remember. 1934. Yeah. Let's see, 1935 is when I... Finished high school from Belmont, Reed School in uh -huh. Belmont, 1935. You know I can remember because yeah. uh, we would walk, I guess, 10 miles d to Gastonia shopping. Yeah. Sure mm -hmm. would. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when all those people came out of Gastonia? No, I don't. <laughs> You got to take a lot of work up in the house. She is 13 miles down to where they live, down in it. They and uh, that's the same. That's that that uh, <laughs> just an another group coming along. Oh, yeah. Now, I know they get to see that uh, picture. Mm -hmm. Because we was, um, black, I doubt whether you didn't see any blacks on there. I haven't been able to find yes, any, no. No. Now, what was yeah. they out there? What was happening? No, was strike, that? No, no, this is just the first day of the big strike. There was a big Labor Day parade. Oh, no. There were no blacks up there. <laughs> and here, look at this. Just thousands of them mm -hmm. in, uh, in Municipal Park. I guess that's Limeburger Park. Right. Uh, I think that's right. Just thousands of them. I should say... Labor Day. That's the group I've been. Yeah, that's right. We were talking to this fella right there. Mm -hmm. He was playing the drums in the the band that was leading this parade. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> talking to him the other day. Yeah. Well. Now, they went around to the different mills and tried to persuade people to close up. And this is a guy named Albert Henson, who's up on a, on a truck there, you see, talking mm -hmm. to them. Now, Henson lived in Belmont. Uh -huh. Did 
Did you, did you ever hear any of those speeches they made? No. I know. <laughs> when a big crowd like that was, you wouldn't find no black city. No, you wouldn't find no that. They'd want to know what you're doing there. No, you wouldn't find no black city. Huh? So how did, I wonder how the blacks then did protest. Uh, we've gotten a number of letters that they have written. Mm -hmm. and about all those people see, dead and gone. That's the only it? thing and they no. could do mm -hmm. is write to the government. Mm -hmm. See, you couldn't go up there and protest at the mill because mm -hmm. the clan wanted to get you. Mm -hmm. So the ones that wrote the letter, some of them signed it and some of them didn't. Mm -hmm. Just like Bruce said, yeah. <laughs> Bruce signed it. He said yes. But now you take. People were scared. The blacks were scared. That's right. Mm -hmm. Because they, they just didn't... It they, they was afraid to be lynched. Mm -hmm. they didn't do nothing. And it, on that whole crowd there, you couldn't find a black in there that was uh, in that parade. The only place we found it is in... Here's, this is in Noonan, Georgia, uh, where old man Talmadge, you remember him? Yeah, yeah. He swore that he wasn't going to call out the National Guard. Mm -hmm. And the night after he got elected, he did. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and they went to Noonan, Georgia, and rounded up a group of pickets, mm -hmm. uh, 126 of them, put them in barbed wire pens in Fort McPherson. Well, here's a picture of those of the troops mm -hmm. and Ooh. the people they rounded up. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you see over here? That's a clan. Look like it. Oh, that's, but what do you see here? Oh, them blacks, I believe. Yeah. Well, them's the only ones that were. That's right. And back here? Mm hmm. No. Now, they're black and we're back there in the corner. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But they're, they're staying mm -hmm. carefully out of this. Mm -hmm. Now, in a newspaper account we have, they said that they picked up, what was it, Judy? 20 or 40 blacks. They picked them up and then let them go, mm -hmm. warning them never to come back. But, uh, but some folks, we got the impression that the, that, the, that the people in the corner there might have been part of the organization to some extent, whereas the people in the background weren't because they seem like they're rounding them up, the people in the front, don't you think? I don't know. I but certainly they were here and here. Mm -hmm. But that's, those are the only things. Uh -huh. And I think you've given us pretty much the explanation of why they weren't around. Yes. <laughs> that's right. Uh, what I was asking uh, uh, Bruce about that, and I said, what was the reason why there weren't any blacks spinning and uh, room fixing and so forth and so on? And he said, why do you think so? <laughs> and I said, well, I think they were saving the jobs for the white man. He laughed. He says, I think you're right. I just want to hear you say that. That <laughs> Bruce is out there. Eh? <laughs> yeah, he's all right. <laughs> we played that over the radio last mm -hmm. Sunday. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you say it took a lot of guts, Bruce, to sign his name? To the oh, letter? yeah. It was, it, it, it just, uh, that's right. It takes a lot of guts to do that. I don't know what I deserve or not. Because I knew what was going on, see. See, he was out in the country like but See, I live pretty close to town. And uh, it would be a lot of, you know, they wouldn't have fun to come out and get me. But they got to go a long way to get Bruce. <laughs> I see. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot. Yeah. Did you... Um, I just think, I mean, aside from writing letters like that, were there ever, what happened when, when black workers just didn't like what was going on in the mills and they did, did, I mean, was there any other form of protest other than letter writing? No, they, they worked, uh, they, they never did quit work, but they would, uh, black, they don't, they didn't know that they were, you know, writing those letters, a lot of them didn't know it, and just like, uh, I don't know. If they noticed, they didn't say nothing about it. But uh, some of them 
didn't find a name, and some of them did. Now, we've also got another letter that was a kind of petition, and it lists a number of mills where these black workers were. Mm -hmm. So it kind of reads like something you might hear from the late 60s, mm -hmm. in the Civil Rights Movement. Oh, yeah, that bring it back, because when I first got out of, out of, out of the Navy, uh, Cocker Machine and Foundry Company, that was a big company that made textile machinery and dye plant machinery. So I had worked there a little while before I went in service. Come on, Lou. Come on, I'll give you a drink. When I came back, I, I went to the, the superintendent and told him that I was uh, the one to learn how to run a, a lay. I said, because uh, the GI Bill said that service men could go to the plant and, and uh, they were supposed to give them a job and teach them how to run a machine. And he looked at me and said that uh, we don't, we're not working no niggas in, in, in this machine shop. I said, okay, so I left. So I went on and, and, and went into building my own, my own. You got a better job. Oh yeah, made more money. Made 40, one year I made $40,000 one year. Had two kids in college and we were doing this fine. And we still living real good. Well now, back in the, in the 20s and 30s, uh, what form of protest was there? Was there anything like an NAACP or anything like that around here? Uh, no. Now that come up later, but it wasn't that, it was a long time before they got that going. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what year that come or started because, you know, it started protesting then uh, for civil rights. That's mm -hmm. where, you know, that was during Martin Luther King's mm -hmm. days, yeah. you know. But that's when they first started that. They, uh, they had somebody, had a leader. They never did have a leader. And after they got a leader, well, see, they would follow the leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about the churches? Were they active then? Yeah, the churches would do what they could do in the church, but they never did do nothing out of it. They tell them what to do. Tell them to be calm and uh, don't, you know, no violence, you know. So they would just, they say a day, what they teach them in the church, they say, a day is coming when we all will be free. And so, in a way, we are free to a certain extent, you know, on jobs. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as, as one who grew up just about along with you, uh, yeah. <laughs> but with a very different kind of background, yeah. it's changed. Yeah, it's changed. It's really changed. I'm just amazed at how it's yeah. changed. Uh -huh. But I was brought up in the church. I used to walk from here to Dallas. It's four miles over there and four miles back. We didn't have no car. We walked to church in the morning, and we stayed. had Sunday school in the afternoon, and we would go to, go to Sunday school in the afternoon. And if we come up a storm, we'd have to tell the storm to us, or we were walking. So I was brought up in the church, and I, I never did cause no trouble with it. I was raised right around here. We were the only black family to live here. Now, my, that, I was raised in a little old three-room house there, and when it rained, uh, it had to set ten to catch the water. And the weather board run straight up and down. It's like an old slavery home that had. And so how how my grandmother was part Indian, she swapped a cow for an acre of land. That little, that little strip of land, there was an acre. She swapped a milk cow. The cow was given two and a half gallons of milk in the morning and two and a half gallons in the evening. And that's what my mother said. She uh, swapped it that cow for acre of land. Okay, then uh, it was some land in the back here. Nobody didn't have, you couldn't get to it unless you come through our driveway. So the man that owned the, the, the mill up there where my daddy was working, he bought the land and then put it in my dad's name. <laughs> now, now, that's how good this white man was. And, that's, and now we got uh, almost four acres of ground. Why did he have to buy it for you? Well, we, we just didn't have the money. 
and uh, and, the, uh, and the people, the white people didn't want to live behind black people. That was the only they couldn't get into, mm -hmm. and 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 to it, then it comes the white driver. So uh, my dad went to Mr. Love, the man that owned the mill up there, and told him that uh, he would like to have that land. He said, "Yeah, I'll get it for you." So he bought the land, and then took my daddy up there and and uh, signed it over to my dad. And my dad paid him seven dollars a week to mm -hmm. pay for it. Seven dollars a week, what he paid for. So that now we got three and three quarter acres and all. Now, how did you get along with the the, the white bosses? Well, uh, we got along with them real good up there at the moat in the mill, because the man that owned the mill, my dad, rented ground from him, and uh, he done a lot of work for him. And they knew not to bother my dad because he would run them off. Yeah. That's right. Because, see, in other words, back in those days, uh, they said, that's my nigga. You don't bother my nigga. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what they would say. Now, I'm telling you like it is. Mm -hmm. I've heard that a many a day. <laughs> and if you're a, uh, they say if you're a good nigga, they're going to help you. But if you're a bad nigga, they're going to put the Ku Klux Klan's on you. Yeah. So I was raised up in the church, and I was, I was good all the time. <laughs> 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 I'm telling you like it is. Yeah. See, people, a lot of people don't know what black people come through. I'm telling you the truth. It's, uh, I, sometimes I lay in the bed yet and, and just think that we've come a long way and still got a long way to go. What's the problem now? Where do you, where do you got to go to? Well, um, I think it, uh, this is it's like in sports, they got a little kick in sports, you know. I noticed on the, uh, this Olympic, I noticed last night, there was a little kick in there. Where they, well, they was, had, they were protesting something, well, the whites, they was protesting against the whites, too, those mm -hmm. foreign countries. And it's still a little inkling in there, uh, in the sports and, and uh, and then the jobs. Now I know some people that got uh, highly qualified, and they tell them, and they said they overqualified for the job. Now what? How is that? <laughs> they won't yeah. give it to them. Say you overqualified. Yeah. Well, what did they go to school for? Mm -hmm. They went to school to be qualified. Mm -hmm. You know what overqualified means? No. That means the guy who's interviewing you is knows that you can do his job. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Well, I could been trying to figure that out. I'm glad you told me. <laughs> he sees the future and it's sitting right in front of him. Yeah. Yeah. Could, can we stop for one second? I want to. I'm getting some clothing noise. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, this is going very well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Now what did he say? He's just photographing me. Oh. Listening oh. to you. Oh. Now, you want us to be talking, huh? No, it's not. It's just you to be talking. Oh. You're giving me nice laughs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Let's go over one of the questions. Let's uh, say I own the kids' room in my aunt's mom, grandpa's mom. Where we go? Can, yeah. can you pass me? Your resume or whatever, do they call it? And they say, well, I went so and so and I got this degree. And they say, well, you overqualified for this job. Say, uh, we can't use you because you know too much, something like that. So we want somebody that uh, just finished uh, high school and maybe got a year in college, mm -hmm. something like that. But uh, I don't, I just did, couldn't figure out why they wouldn't give the people a job that was qualified. But he told me what, <laughs> <laughs> he told me what. The reason they did. Well, you've you've had a black mayor of Gastonia, didn't you? Oh yeah, uh -huh, well, yeah. Uh, Nathaniel Barber. Mm -hmm. He was a mayor there. He was real good. And then we had a bank. Uh, he was the president of the Black Bank. It was a Excelsior Credit Union. We had I forget how many million dollars in that bank. And uh, then after he died, they turned it over to another guy, and he. Loan out a lot of money without any security, mm. and we lost that bank, and we just uh, 
was all upset, but there wasn't nothing we could do about it. We thought we had the right man to take it over, but we we just uh, run out too much money. Some mm -hmm. guys owed forty thousand dollars without any security and all mm -hmm. that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. So uh, it's one of those things. And now a friend of mine up there, he was had a cleaning business lived up there, up the road in that brick house. He he had all the Bell Telephone companies. And he was making two hundred and forty thousand dollars a year. He had uh, thirty some employees paying a minimum wage. And uh, him and another guy was going to open up the credit union. Him and uh, it was some guys out of New York and went to Salem. It was four black guys. And so when they went to get the whatever you call it permit or whatever mm -hmm. you get to, to operate another yeah, charter. Bank, charter and they wanted to know uh, how much money is it? Leave yes, it will. Leave it off, Alma. So they said it, uh, uh, they told them how much money they had and uh, that they had to have four million dollars. Mm. Well, they didn't have four million. And I told them, I said, um, I said, if you're going to operate a bank, I said, if you got two million, the government's supposed to let you have uh, so much to go with that and supposed to set you up. But they wouldn't let it happen. Wouldn't let them open the bank up. Mm. That's right, wouldn't let them open up. Mm. And this, they, these men had money. And he's living up there now in a big fine brick house. He bought it from a white guy. Haywood Massey mm. is his name. And he... He had all the Bell Telephone Company, and uh, he had them in Belmont, Shelby, Dallas, Gastonia. He's a cleaning business. He he worked thirty some employees. They they you know done the cleaning mm -hmm. in these big offices, but they wouldn't let them mm -hmm. open it up. Judy, well, you have a question. Well, while it's quiet and all, mm -hmm. I was just thinking maybe we could go back and talk a little bit about when we first went into the mill and this. I don't know if that's okay because we had a lot of different issues. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, just let's go back to tell us about what it was like when you first went in the mill. How old you were? And I was 13 years old, and uh, the, the, the mill was uh, operating from a 66, and the blacks were, but I never didn't know whether the whites was working that many hours or not because we was on the back down at the ballroom. We didn't know what was going on. Uh, we was doing it. Unloading coal in a wheel bar and put 40 wheel bar fulls in the evening and 40 wheel bar fulls in the morning. And then we go to the warehouse and open up cotton and bale waste. Then go back to the night when we get that done, it's time to uh, uh, roll in some more coal. When, and when you did that, it's time to go home. Yeah, it was kind of rough. But then we had, uh, see, in the mill, they had an inside plumbing, but uh, on the outside, we had an outhouse. We had an outhouse, and we had a certain place you drank water, and you couldn't drink out the cooler. So we learned to live with it. <laughs> you had to learn to live with it, and I drank no water. I used to go down to the bright. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we had a lot of good white friends, and they would come tell us that he said, y'all have been being treated real bad, but said, ain't, ain't nothing two or three people, can, two or three whites can do anything about it. He said, y'all are good, they said, y'all are good darkest, that's what they call us. Mm -hmm. Y'all are good darkest, but said, it, uh, I feel sorry for you, but I, we can't help you. But, but they would give us, if you want to borrow anything, they would give it to you, uh, help you out. A lot of good white mm -hmm. people. But it was some real bad ones. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Talk about the Ku Klux Klan then. Oh yeah, they 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 march. They would march sometime every week. They'd get a permit and march every week, and uh, they marched down at Lowell about a month ago, and in Dallas they marched over there. Uh, I think about once a month. Yes, mm -hmm. be about twelve of them. Don't be. They don't uh, don't no crowd come out there and you know watch them. You don't see nobody out there, really. 
I think people just shame us. What about back then? Oh, back then, I'm talking about now. Back mm -hmm. then, oh, oh, they'd get a big crowd then, man. They'd have maybe a hundred. For the clan? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now, you don't see no, you might see the, uh, the media making pictures or something like that. But the media don't make the pictures no more. They find out that that's what the clans want. Mm -hmm. So they quit making it. <laughs> so now you don't see no more than about, uh, about eight or ten clans marching. <laughs> And no, no audience. Yeah. See, in the, it's, it's. I think it's, in a way, it's. I think the kind of. If it is, they're not letting nobody know it. It's a lot of clansmen now, but you don't know who they are. They don't. They don't march no more. Did you know who they were back then? No, you didn't know. They had on hoods. You didn't know who they were. Could have been policemen. Couldn't tell. We've heard that um, often, even though you know you might you could only run a machine, uh, you know that you only worked on the outside, that you might go into you know that 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 some black workers they were needed on the inside. Someone took a break, and the overseer would say, "Hey, go over to this machine and run that machine." And so that actually they learned how to run some of the machines. Did that kind of thing happen? No, not not at the plant where I was. Because uh, if that machine, uh, if the man was out, that machine stood. No blacks go in there and run the machine. The only blacks that was in there was two women, and they were mopping the mill floors and, and cleaning the, the custodians, you know, the toilets. And uh, the first you uh, could get a black that was the women, they could go in there and mop the floors and all like that. That's what called scrubbers. And then the, uh, it was see it was about uh, six or seven black uh, down at the boiler room in the warehouse. That's where you could get. But when I come back out of service, I went to talk a machine founding company where I was working uh, before I went in service. And uh, I told them I wanted to uh, learn to run a, a lay, a machine. And they shook their head and and said, "No, nah, we don't. Uh, we don't want no black to run the machine." I said, "Well, the government said that uh, go to the machine shop and and they would uh, see that I got a job because uh, uh, I'm a veteran." And I said, "No, no." So I just didn't do it. So I went in the business loan. Yeah, went on. It was something that Jamie and I were talking about when you were gone that has not too much to do with this, but we'd like to record it. Uh, could you tell us about the Chicago thing that Port you were talking about? Yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, Port Chicago. I was stationed at Mary Island, California, 18 miles from uh, Port Chicago. And uh, when that thing blew up, uh, I was in my barracks. And uh, we were integrated at that time. And uh, it was a white person slept in a bunk over my head. And he was out on liberty. And when that glass fell out, a piece of glass come out of that window, stuck right up in his pillow, right where his head was supposed to be. And then uh, it was a lot of blacks and Marines and sailors and so was out on liberty. And they, they came back that about break of day they had all kind of watches, clothes, anything you want. You could get it wholesale. Because <laughs> all the show clothes. And they even had these, yeah, dope and pension dogs patrolling the, the coast. Thought that, the, you know, thought it was a sabotage. And they had them dogs and big rifles walking up and down the coast there. And uh, I'm glad it wasn't that there uh, naval uh, ammunition depot that we had. Because it was just right across the bay from where we were. But then it, it was built on a golf course. So they were loading a shipload of 16-inch ammunition when it Well, we did, no, we, we did our loading in daylight, see. And uh, those big old 16-inch uh, injectors, all that was coming in daylight. But that ship blowed up at night up at Port Chicago. It was at night when that happened. 
Well, I, uh, we had a black uh, uh, officer, and he told us that it was 400 got killed. And they said it wasn't but 390 some, but he said it was 400, because he was up with the top men, this black officer. He was from New York. He was over us, but he had a white officer over them, over him. And it was 4,000 blacks on that base. 4,000. And then uh, they had a draft come up, and there was a white boy who had the same name that I had. As far as I know, he was from Dallas, North Carolina, right over there, about, uh, about four miles from here. And they sent my record, when the draft come up, they sent my record over to the South Pacific with him and left his record there with me. And when the time to get paid, see, we got paid twice a month, say, uh, in the Navy. And uh, I went to the chaplain and wanted to know how come I, I'm not getting my money. He said, well, wait a minute, I'll go and check the record and see. And he come back and looked at me, he said, what you doing here? I said, I'm supposed to be here. He said, man, you're supposed to be over in South Pacific. He said, that's where your record is. He said, this is a white man's record here. He told me, and see, it tells you, who, you know, your, your, your nationality. And uh, he said, well, I declare. He said, it's allowed to be two or three months before you get your money. But I think it was not that long when I got my money. Is he the same rank as you, the, the white fellow? Yeah, uh -huh, the same rank. Is he, is he making more money or less money than you? I don't know. I don't know. He could have, because see, I never did get to see his record. I don't know. Yeah, I got, uh, see, I was getting, uh, see, how much was I getting? I was getting a check twice a month, and my wife was getting one once a month. But I can't remember. It seemed like we was getting, oh, maybe $50, $60 a month, I believe, mm -hmm. some along there. It wasn't much. Because, see, uh, up there in uh, uh, California, you see, in Gamble, you go and play uh, blackjack, anything you want. And we uh, that was just about two blocks from my base. And we go, we go up there and play blackjack. Sometimes I win a lot of money, and I'd send it home to my wife. And sometimes you lose a lot of money. And oh, yeah. You wouldn't tell her. No, I wouldn't tell her. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't tell her. But when I win a lot, I'd send it home. Beautiful. <laughs> I, I have another question. Okay. okay. I just want you to know, you look so good. <laughs> Yeah? Yeah. You look so good on that monitor. All right. Oh, man. You pretty. Beautiful. Stunning. As they say back home. Yeah. 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 Ever hear that? Okay. Stunning. Um, it? Okay. Yeah. Could you tell me what it was like when you were just, I mean, pretend you're 13 years old and you're going into the mill. What did it, what did that feel like? I mean, and the weight of stuff, you know? Well, I'll tell you what. I was kind of uh, shy. I didn't know what the setup was going to be, but the only thing that kept me going, see, my dad was already working there, running this engine, and uh, and then I had some cousins that was rolling that coal. They were grown, and then uh, when I went there, I was 13 years old, and then I kind of blend in with them, but I, at first I didn't know how to, I noticed we couldn't drink water here, and, you know, and you had to use the outhouse and all that kind of stuff. And I, uh, I finally learned out what was happening. <laughs> yeah, I found out what was happening. Well, once again, uh, 